Presenter today is Dr. Christine Keisinger, and she serves as Vice President of Development and is Lead Trainer of Emotional Intelligence and Conscious Communication at Studio B. Studio B is a company dedicated to bringing mindfulness-based practices into organizations to ease burnout, increase productivity, strengthen resilience, and create a healthier workspace and culture. Christine has specially, special expertise in the areas of communication, leadership, mindfulness, and is deeply devoted to supporting leaders in navigating difficult terrain of leadership during a difficult uh, pandemic. And Dr. Keisinger, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. That last sentence there in that introduction is really, really important to me and so important to us at Studio B. We are very mindful of everything that you have been facing in your own leadership over the course of the last 10 to 12 weeks. And so this training is specifically designed for you. Um, I'm happy that you're here because what it tells me is that you're committed to yourself as a leader, you are committed to your team, your employees, your staff, and you are committed to your organization. Throughout the rest of the presentation, I'm going to be referring to teams, employees, and staff simply as teams, because really that's how I see everyone that you lead as your team. So recently I published a blog that you can find at Studio B Mindfulness, and you actually will have access to it in a, a resource guide that I put together that you will receive following this presentation. But I wrote a blog that specifically addresses the issues that many of you have been facing as leaders. And I wanna highlight some of those things. And I wanna highlight them because I think it's really important that we get really honest and put it all out on the table. This is what leadership has been like, has felt like over the course of the last 10 to 12 weeks. As a leader, you have had to ensure productivity address and manage your employees' anxieties. And far too many of you have had to have really difficult conversations with your teams, perhaps about furloughs and unpredictable futures. As a leader, they count on you for your guidance, for answers, and for security. And the pandemic has created a situation where you might not have the answers and you certainly don't know what's going to evolve. So the uncertainty still looms large. I bet that you've had to say, I don't know, more times than you've ever had to say in your tenure as a leader. On top of all of this, I'm also certain that many of you have had to begin completely reimagining the future of your organization, the future of your business. And so this training was really designed to offer you support, to perhaps give you some insight into what your teams might be thinking, feeling, fearing, and really needing from you. But most of all, I want you to leave this presentation feeling really empowered. Because in the midst of crisis, this crisis, there is enormous opportunity. And I think you're really going to understand what that opportunity is by the time we get to the end of the hour. So what's the context? Let's get very clear about what the context is, because COVID-19 is not our typical crisis. I was talking to a colleague of mine who does strategic crisis management. He mentors leaders through crisis. And he said, I've mentored leaders through all kinds of crisis situations, natural disasters, issues with products that were poisoned and were, went out into the public. You know, and he's responsible for messaging around these kinds of emergencies. But he said, this one is really different. This is not a 9-11. This is not a national disaster. This is not a weather-based disaster. When those things happen, we have the devastating incident. We're able to assess the devastation. And then there's a period of time where we dig in and we start to clean it all up. But there's always an end in sight. There's always a sense that we're gonna be able to come back. But we don't have that sense. We know we'll be coming back, but we don't quite know when. 
So there's no timeline on this one. There really isn't any frame of reference in our personal histories that we can call upon that helps us to shape the path forward. And many of us, leaders, managers, and our teams are living out of the stress response. There's a threat out there, but it's unseen. We don't even quite know the gravity of it. We don't know when and if it will enter our workplace, our homes, our lives, our health, but it's out there. So many of us are living from stress response. And when we live out of stress response, there is a very, very strong need to get ready to fight, to resist what is, or to run, to pretend to deny that it's not there, or to freeze and shut down. And there's a real reason for us. And we're grateful that we have this capacity as human beings because it helps us to survive. But when the threat is unseen and when the pathway ahead is unknown, stress response looms large. And many of us, especially those on your team, might be living in stress response 24 seven. So this isn't our typical crisis. And this is not a marathon. This is, and the reason I chose this slide, this is an ultra marathon. Now I want you to think about what it takes to participate, to run in an ultra marathon. Part of what it takes is having a very keen sense of your own energy and making very wise and clear decisions about how you're gonna spend your energy. So I want you to contemplate these questions because they're important ones in supporting you in your path ahead. What is the very best expenditure of my energy as a leader, of our energy as an organization right now? Right now. Not what it was 10 weeks ago or what it might be a week from now, but right now, what is the very best expenditure of my energy? What is the most vitally important thing for me to do right now? For me to say right now, communicate. What decision is most vitally important now? And what is most vitally important for me to think about? These are really important questions. What does my organization need for me now as a leader? And what do my teams need? And we'll get into that in a moment. Because if I can lead to need right now, I'm gonna really be stepping up in powerful ways. I love this question. What is the next best and most essential step forward? Do that, whatever the answer is, do that and then make a correction if necessary. And then finally, if everything were to just close down right now and I couldn't share anything else with you, this is a game-changing question in terms of your own leadership. What is it that you most need right now to help you to feel at your optimal level as you navigate the way forward? Right now, the now is a really important aspect of this question. I can tell you that what I needed 10 weeks ago, five weeks ago, is not what I need right now. And I can also tell you that what you're going to need to support you and your leadership moving forward is going to be different from what you need right now. So what you need right now might be something as simple as more sleep which actually is pretty significant. It might be something as simple as a cool glass of iced tea. It might be that you know that you need to get on the phone with your own personal mentor for some coaching to support you in your leadership. It might be that you know that you might need to give, give your team a pep talk so that they feel a little more safe about what's to come. But what is it that you most need now? Don't allow yourself to get so swept up in the stress and overwhelm of it all that you're not asking very strategic, very mindful questions about where's my energy going, what's vitally important, what needs attention now, 
and mostly, what do I need? Because if I'm not fulfilling those needs, the rest of it might fall apart. What I can tell you is that this is not a time for what is called analysis paralysis. And many of us, leaders included, when we feel the anxiety of what's happening, we go into analysis paralysis. It's a manifestation of stress. I can't make a decision. I'm worried about the decisions that I'm making. I'm analyzing the way that I'm leading so much so that I feel paralyzed. It's actually the way in which we're freezing neurologically in the face of stress. This is also not the time for fighting the reality of what is. I might not like what's happening, but man, as a leader, I need to be really clear about what the situation is in order to lead well. And this is not the time for running away, for denying or minimizing what's happening. Remember this for your team and coach them through this. When you see one of your team members stuck in analysis paralysis, know that that's fear. Know that that's stress. When you see them railing against what is or running, minimizing, denying, that's stress. This just gives you a little bit of insight into what they're thinking and feeling. This is a time to protect yourself from what I call the ravages of fear-based thinking and decision making. Protect yourself from that by taking care of your stress levels. Make this one of your key priorities. Here's what we know for certain. Decision making, strategic thinking does not go well when it is grounded in a brain, in a mind that's really stressed out and afraid. I don't wanna make any decisions about my team, a project or my organization out of fear. And nor do you want your team members doing that. So this is a kind of a good pep talk, talk to have for them. This is not the time, and this is the time for certain things. And this is also the time for you to contemplate some pretty radical changes and advances that you might make in your own leadership. And this is the exciting part for me, and this is where I wanna be your cheerleader moving forward. Many of us have this sense that everything has kind of been gutted or leveled. Whatever was pre-March 14th or maybe a little bit earlier, it just isn't anymore. There may be vestiges of it still around, but we're moving into something that's quite different. So when something gets leveled, there's an opening. And when there's an opening, there's always opportunity. And there's always possibility. And there's always potential. One of the things, key ingredients that is going to be required of leaders moving forward in what I call the new face of leadership is the capacity to reframe experience. Crisis what comes with it? Opportunity. I don't have to like the crisis, but I'm reframing. What's the opportunity here? What's the possibility here? What is the potential here for you, my team, for you, for, for, for us, this organization, for me as a leader? So if there have been things that you've been thinking about that you want to change up in your leadership, or you want to elevate your leadership, or you want to come into a more mindful, empowered, transformational leadership style, go at it. Now is the time. So some really interesting questions that you might ask yourself. Take a screenshot of this slide. You can contemplate these things later. And you'll also have access to a recording of this. But maybe send, spend a little bit of time asking yourself, how am I going to motivate my team or ha how am I motivating my team towards something new? We're not going back. Really important. I tell leaders to try to avoid language like when we go back to work or when we return to normal or when we get to new normal. Let's try to eliminate that kind of languaging and say things like we are moving toward something different. 
there might be vestiges of the past, but we're moving into and toward something different. How can I motivate them toward something new? Something that is sustainable and weatherproof. And what I mean by this is lots of different organizations are rethinking what they do because they now understand this pandemic kind of came out of the blue. It descended upon us in a way that felt very abrupt. And it's making us question whether or not what we do is sustainable because it wasn't weatherproofed. So whatever changes we make now, let's make them in a way that we're thinking about sustainability and we're thinking about, is this gonna weather the next storm, whatever it is that might come along? Can you allow space to be curious, to be creative, so that you can be wildly innovative? I was listening to a webinar that featured key leaders from Ford and Comcast, and I was really struck by a comment that the leader from Comcast made when she said, within the first two weeks of all of this hitting, we had an understanding then in order to survive in what was going to be transforming into a new and different market, we had to become aggressively and wildly innovative. That's tough when people are freaking out because in terms of the way that our brains work, high levels of stress, being in fight, flee, freeze mode, doesn't allow for that part of your brain that can think a creative thought to even be turned on. It behooves us as leaders to do whatever we can do, to take whatever measures we need to take to be taking exceptional self-care, exceptional care of ourselves, doing whatever we can to keep stress response minimal because my Lord, I need that part of my brain that's capable of creative, innovative thinking, not just regular creativity and innovation, aggressive and wild. Can I be up to the task of doing my work, of doing my best, being effective, reaching the outcomes that I need to reach and perhaps doing it differently? These are questions that all leaders need to be asking themselves during this phase. And I know this is a lot. This is a lot, but this is why we're here today. What should we be tending to? Here's the truth. Let's get the truth out on the table. The truth is our teams need to do their jobs. They need to do their work. And they need to do their work in the context of monumental change and uncertainty. And we have, unless we've talked to them personally, we have no idea what monumental change and uncertainty means for them in their personal lives and the lives of their family. So when you're talking with a team member, you're not just talking about the work, you're talking about the work in the context of monumental change and uncertainty that is present with them as they come into the conversation. So we just have to be aware of that. Um, part of the new face of leadership requires that leaders have an understanding of what they need to do, what their teams need to do to produce, but what their team members are also feeling and experiencing just some glimpse into that. In other words, our leaders are being called to step into a level of humanity. As one of my colleagues said, who works in high leadership at Pepsi, PepsiCo, she said, I find myself being called into a high ethical sense of humanity. And at the same time, boundaried in such a way that I can lead my teams into productive and effective work during this really difficult time. So it's this balance between honoring humanity and inspiring 
the best of what they can get can give you during this strange time. What's also true is that your teams are relying on you now more than ever because they are looking for what I call the calm one on the boat. And I've used this analogy now over the course of the last 12 weeks, I don't even know how long it's been, 10, 12 weeks, because it works. And I wanna share this with you and I wanna start having you think about the degree to which you desire to be, have had to become the calm one on the boat. And this comes from the work of Thich Nhat Hanh. And he writes, in Vietnam, there are many people called boat people who leave the country in small boats. Often the boats are caught in rough seas and storms. The people may panic, the boats might sink. But if even one person aboard can remain calm, lucid, knowing what to do, what to say, what not to do, he or she can help the boat survive. His or her expression, face, voice communicates clarity, calmness, and the people will trust that person. They will listen to that person. They will be led by that person or willing to be led by that person. Can you be the calm one on the boat? You're being called to be that. Calm is contagious. Steadiness is contagious. A sense of resiliency is contagious. Don't let the boat go under. They're looking to you to save the boat, the organization, and everyone on it. So what does the calm one on the boat look like? When I really contemplated this, I realized that the calm one on the boat, the steady leader, the resilient leader, embodies what we know to be the top five qualities of resilient coping. And that is the ability for calm. Again, even in the midst of a storm, the ability for clarity. Good decision-making does not occur in a chaotic mind. The ability to remain connected. Our teams need to feel connected to you. So relationship and your willingness to connect with them in meaningful ways, in ways that go beyond that work that needs to get done is gonna be really critical now and moving forward. It's part of the new face of leadership. The calm one on the boat is competent. This is not a time to doubt your skills. This is a time to reflect upon what I'm good at, what my strengths are, what is my A game, and to show up in that competency. Because one of the things we know about stress is it erodes our competency. Suddenly we start doubting ourselves. So stay on top of that. The calm one on the boat is courageous. The calm one on the boat is assessing the waters and knows I gotta take some risks here to get us to where we need to go. But they're courageous and they find courage in their calm, in their clarity, in their connection, in their competency. And then there's three that I have found kind of extras that are really important in being the calm one on the boat. Consciously communicating, and we're gonna talk about that a little more deeply in a moment. Compassion. Your team wants to see compassion in you because they are terrified. Many of them are terrified, remain terrified. And if you can show some of the softness of compassion, they will trust you. Because when we're afraid, we are looking to trust. Right? So that compassion piece is really important. The calm one is also curious. And we'll talk a little bit more about the role that curiosity plays in the new face of leadership in a moment as well. So at the very beginning of 
the global pandemic really sort of settling into our consciousness and our lives. I was reading an article in the New York Times by a psychiatrist who was talking about what is the highest human need right now? Globally, what are all human beings needing? And she said, it's two things. They need to feel safe and they need to feel connected above everything else. Well, a global pandemic is a threat to both of these things, a threat to our sense of safety and a threat to our connection. Is my health safe? Is my family safe? Is my job safe? Is my financial situation safe? Lots of things feel unsafe. And connections, many of our connections are strained. Many of us are living together with our families 24-7 and we've never lived like that before and it's stressful and then many of us are separated from our loved ones due to social distancing and separated from our colleagues that we rely upon to do our work well so these two things are threatened but what does this mean for leaders if i know this as a leader i know that Despite external circumstances, I've got to show up in a way, I've got to communicate in a way that has my team feeling safe and connected. So how do I do that? I need to understand what scares them. I need to understand what scares me, what's scaring everyone. Again, this is one of those slides. Take a screenshot of it if you'd like, but this is an important one. This gives you insight into why people are feeling anxious. They're worried about their status. Where, where do I stand? Let's just talk about the organization. They worry about these things in all areas of their lives right now, but let's just talk about it organizationally. Where do I stand here? Where do I fit in? Is my job the same? Do I have a job? Am I going to have a job? Is this organization different? Where do I fit in here? We want to know where we stand. And sometimes the answer is, I don't know. But I need to be honest with you about that as your leader. Certainty, when are we going back to work? What is it going to be like? Is it gonna be the same? Is it gonna be different? Is my job even certain at all? Will I be in a different role? My colleague at PepsiCo said that this is the number one call that HR is getting a hundred or more times a day. When are we coming back? What is it going to be like? What is it going to look like? Am I going to be doing the same job? There's a lot of anxiety around that. So know that that's likely there in your teams too. How autonomous am I going to be able to be? Because I've been told I have to stay home. I've been told that there's certain places I can and cannot go. I've been told that I need to wear um, PPE. You know, how autonomous am I gonna be? Because we are so motivated. Daniel Pink's work tells us that as leaders, we can always wildly motivate our teams every time we give them autonomy, every time we loosen the reins a bit and we encourage them to independently make decisions or to bring their best to the table. Well, how, how much of that can we do as we're moving forward? Just remember that every time or every opportunity that you can find to foster a little bit of autonomy in your team, they're gonna rise up to the occasion. They're wondering about relationship. How are we gonna still stay connected? We're not going to be able to gather around the water cooler or maybe get together for lunch or have our after five happy hours or, or whatever it is. How are we going to stay connected in the workplace? This is really important. This is not a trivial matter. We look at the former Surgeon General's vast research on loneliness in the workplace. In fact, he just published a book on this and I believe it's called Loneliness. And he reveals quite a bit about the correlation between work fulfillment, high work productivity, retention, and the degree to which I feel connected in my workplace. And I won't perform as well. I won't want to stay in a position. 
you will never get the best out of me if I feel lonely. Might sound trivial, but his research is no nonsense. And if you've ever seen him interviewed about his research, he presents it in a highly serious way. So how are relationships going to be taken care of or managed or, or expressed in, as, we, as we move forward? And then finally, this is a really important one, fairness. Will I be treated with dignity and respect? Will you, as my leader, hear me? Um, a colleague of mine who runs a business in North Carolina told me a story that, that really aligns well with this final statement here on the slide. Um, and that is the deep, deep concern that one of uh, a key member of his team has about the virus and, and very, very deep fears about it and a very big reluctance to come back to the office anytime soon. And, um, and he's been really listening with, to her about that and trying to accommodate her in ways that she feels safe and protected and can still do her work. But the conversation that I was having with him is this idea that part of his leadership now involves this kind of really deep listening and this kind of responding to the needs that she has. So how do we do all of this? How do we juggle this on top of trying to do our work and trying to keep the organization functioning at a high level? In other words, how do we motivate, inspire, and engage? Number one, and you'll see this everywhere, I mean, this is really all people are talking about right now in terms of leading and managing through COVID-19. Can you create a sense of personal and professional safety for your team? But it often stops at that because there's so much more that we need to do, but this is number one. They need to know that you have a concern for their personal and their professional safety. Number two is a real game changer as often as possible. If you want to lift, motivate, and inspire your crew, reconnect them to the purpose and the mission of your organization. If you have forgotten what it is, go back and look. This has been invaluable. Um, when I was chatting with my colleague at PepsiCo, she said, we are leaning into big time the mission of this organization. We are reminding our teams of that mission, and most important, the role that they play in that mission. We need you to carry this out. This is not, our mission and purpose is not just something that we came up with that sits on a plaque on your desk or is painted onto the wall. This is something that we live, and it's, it's what our work is rooted in. And remind them of that and focus on interdependency. I might be the captain of this ship as your leader, but my Lord, I need you. We need you. This organization needs you or the ship is going to go down. So I might be the captain, but I need you. How? How do I do this? How do I convey, continue to motivate and inspire? How do I lead? And you might already be doing these things, but I wanna put these things on your radar. Number one, be honest and transparent. This is an opportunity for you to practice mindful, intentional, conscious communication. It sounds like this, be direct and clear, eliminate ambiguity. Be informative. Offer them the information that you believe they most need that you have access to. Be very honest about the state of things and this is not a time for you to be afraid to say, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that now. When I do, I will let you know. This is a time to say there are a lot of things that I don't know, but I'm going to tell you what you can expect from me. And you make a list of three to five things that your team can expect from you because they are looking 
for more reasons to trust you. When fear is high, trust is low. When fear is low, trust is high. Give them reasons to trust you. What can they expect of you? Practice THINK. This is an acronym that's invaluable, and if you're interested in what it means to be a mindful, conscious communicator, practice THINK. The acronym T. Is what I'm about to say true? Is what I'm about to send out there in an email or text, is it true? Because if it's not, I ought not send it, I ought not say it. H, is what I'm about to say even honest? If it's not, don't do it. I, is what I'm about to communicate insightful? Meaning, does it push things forward? I don't wanna communicate in a way that keeps us stuck. I don't wanna communicate in a way that pushes us backwards or suppresses anything. I wanna know that whatever it is that I'm saying is insightful and moves us forward. Is what I'm about to say even necessary? That's the end. Think about that one and you'll eliminate half of what you say. Because most of, a lot of what we say is just not necessary. The new face of leadership is going to require brevity in our communication. We're gonna be getting right to the point. And most importantly, and it might sound trite, but is what I'm about to say kind. I might have to break bad news, but you know what? I can do it in a kind way. I might have to give you some feedback, but I can do it in a kind way. So commit to conscious, intentional, mindful communication through that acronym. Is it true? Is it honest? Is it insightful? Is it necessary? Is it kind? And when you when there's a no to sum up, don't do it. Just don't do it. Share, think with your team. Make it a policy. This is how we're going to communicate with each other. And this is part of the new face of our workplace culture. Number two, ask of your teams hard work and flexibility. Make it known that for now, we're digging in. We're digging in. Some of us are gonna have to do things that maybe we'd never have to do before. Some of us are gonna have to step outside of our role. Some of us are gonna have to be really flexible and maybe enter into ventures and endeavors in our work that we never even imagined. And model it. Get in the trenches with them. Get dirty with them. They need to see your own willingness to be with them, to be like them. It inspires trust. Everybody right now, we need to be flexible. We need to think out of the box and we need to do things that we might not like to do. Um, and we may not do, we may need to do things that we don't feel quite qualified to do, but we are all jumping into this together. What do I do when somebody fumbles as a leader? Because they will. They will. We're going to have a lot of fumbles, a lot of mistakes. So what do you do? Be very clear, direct, and honest in your communication about the fumble, the mistake, the issue, and have a lot of compassion because that fumble occurred in the context of a global pandemic but also emphasize that I have to do good business. We have to do good business. Take a screenshot of this slide. There's some language here that might be really helpful when you have to navigate through or lead through a fumble. I need you to know that I acknowledge the mistake here. I see the mistake, the fumble. This is what has to happen going forward. This is what I expect going forward from you. And this is what you can expect from me, your leader. And how can I best support you moving forward? Those two final statements are really critical. I wanna be really clear. This is what needs to happen. This, these are the expectations. I know that this is a weird, strange time. 
this is what you can expect from me and how can I best support you moving forward? That's how you lead through a fumble. You approach it when it happens. Don't maul over it, ruminate about it. You approach it when it happens. Clean, direct, caring. All three elements are present in that message. Really work to foster your own creativity and curiosity. I want to reiterate, and I don't have a lot of time to do this, but I just need you to know, neurologically speaking, the part of the brain where creativity and curiosity lives and is best expressed isn't quite uh, logged on, signed in when you're in stress response. So if you know that your organization, your team needs some reimagining, you've got to create some space for creativity and curiosity to occur so that you can be, like the Comcast leader indicated, wildly innovative. Not all organizations, but many organizations find themselves in this position. And I want you to inspire wild innovation in your team. I want you to ask them to bring forth their best and their brightest ideas because we need to see everything. I want you to practice what's called dual awareness and interdependence. Dual awareness means that you are gonna take an opportunity on a very regular basis, maybe three times per day, to ask yourself, what do I need? What do I need? What do I need to best support myself in my leadership role? Again, it might be anything from, I need to be more hydrated, to I need to read more articles in Harvard Business Review, to I need to take a course in emotional intelligence, to I need to meditate. That's, a, that's an important one right there. Um, what is it? What do you need to do? What do I need to do? And what does my team need? What does my organization need? Have the dual awareness because they're interdependently linked. The better I take care of myself, the better I serve the organization. The better the organization is served, the better it serves me. Practice dual awareness. Thinking about you and thinking about the organization and the connection between the two. Last slide on this, last tip, your communication. I want you to consider language and languaging your message when you talk to your team in talking about the organization as a shared entity. I'm gonna give you an example, and through the example, this will be made very clear. All right, I'm gonna take Studio B as an example here. Our leader might say something like, and this would have a lot of impact, what Studio B needs right now? Studio B needs our hard work and our flexibility. And Studio B needs for us all to be okay with uncertainty. And Studio B is really welcoming your ingenuity, your creative ideas. We're in a pivot like most other companies. So let's embrace the opportunity. This is what Studio B needs. This message is very inclusive. And this message is not, I need you to be hardworking and flexible. I need your creative and creative ideas. I need for you to pivot. It takes the emphasis off the leader and it puts the emphasis on what the leader and the team share, which is the organization. So talk about the organization and what you need from your team like this. What does the company need? What does it need from all of us? We're on the boat together. I might be the captain, but we're all together. So it's acknowledging that interdependency. I wanna skip ahead for the sake of time because I want to introduce you to a practice that will help you to embody what I'm referring to really is the new face of leadership. You can use this as a stress reduction technique, 
but you can also use this to come into your leadership immediately in a way where you feel really strong and grounded. Like, yeah, I'm the, I'm the captain of the ship here. I'm the calm one on the ship here. I'm strong in everything I know, my competency, my belief in myself and my abilities, my belief in all of you in this company. I'm also really steady. And I'm also willing to be really connected to all of you. So it helps to create those three things, which is really the heart of today's presentation. How can I lead from a sense of strength and empowerment? How can I be calm at the same time? And how can I re remain connected? And the only other thing that I would add to this is how can I stay optimistic? Because I'm going to have times as a leader where I'm not going to feel optimistic. And the way that you stay optimistic is to remember the yellow slide, is to remember to lead from this place. Everything has changed. It's been leveled, but there's opening. And when there's opening, there's opportunity, there's possibility, and there's endless potential for who I am as a leader, for who you are as a team member, and for what this organization is and will become. So this will take just about five minutes or so. I just wanna give you a very quick experience. I'm gonna to talk to you then a little bit about what happened after the experience and then just give you a little bit of recommendations um, before we bring this to a close. So I would like to invite you to just take a moment to sit very comfortably wherever you are. And if you feel comfortable, I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to just take the first few moments, maybe to just take some very deep, and cleansing breaths. Maybe disconnecting from everything that's around you and just focus on those breaths. And I want you to straighten up just a little bit through the spine so that your spine feels tall. And you can kind of touch into the, the dignity of your own spine. And the mere straightening up of that spine helps to create a sense of calm through the system. And next, I want you to just draw your awareness down to your feet and just feel the feet against the floor. And for just the next few moments, really connecting to the strength of your own two feet. And know that when we establish this connection, we really can feel grounded. And now I'd like you to just allow the shoulders to soften. Just sort of drop them down because when we're stressed, the shoulders come up towards the ears. So just drop them down and maybe bring them back just a little bit. And you're going to notice this sense that there's more space through the chest. And maybe you'll find it a little easier to breathe. So we have just centered through our spine, grounded through our feet, and we've created this expansion through the front of the body.
and in just a few minutes, we have created a shift. Neurologically, chemically, hormonally. Which leads us to a sense of calm, strength, and openness. And this is what it means and how it feels to embody the new face of leadership through and beyond a crisis. And you show up as the leader who is calm, strong, and very open to staying connected to the team. Whenever you're ready, gently open your eyes. This is what it means to prime yourself for leadership. Again, the heart of this presentation really are those three themes. Can I stay strong and steady? Can I be the calm one on the boat? And can I remain really open to the humanity of those that I lead? In just that very brief period of time, we centered through our spines, we grounded through our feet, and we just dropped the shoulders and brought them back, opening through the front of the body. And we don't have the time to get into the biology of all of that. But if you felt a sense of ease and rest in that, good. Use that as often as you can. As a brief meditative practice, it'll help to keep you out of stress response. But you can also come into this in any moment. You can come into this state before a Zoom call, before your next meeting with your team. Play with it. See what happens. See what happens when in your communication, your next communication with them, you come in like that, calm, strong, and open. Before I say goodbye, um, I would love for you, if you're willing, in the chat, if you could just write a couple of words or a couple of ideas that really resonated with you today in today's presentation. Um, I would really love that feedback and to get a sense of what it is that you've been thinking about through all of this. And I also want to call um, into the forefront our founder and CEO of Studio B, Jennifer Sarambuli, who has a wonderful offer for each of you to support you as you continue to lead through and beyond COVID-19. Thanks, Christine. And hi, everyone. Uh, I am so excited to be here with all of you today. I just wanted to thank Christine for her beautiful offering today and all of her words of wisdom. Uh, Christine was one of our first employees at Studio B, and she is my right hand uh, person. She's the person I look to for everything that I need to remain steady and to keep the team inspired and uh, connected. Uh, and it's been especially challenging over the last 10 weeks or so uh, working through this crisis. So Christine has been instrumental in offering all of us um, advice and, and tools to work with. Um, so I can assure you that, uh, you know, everything that she's talked to you about today and all of the methods and practices and techniques that 
we work with both as a team and individually uh, to manage and meet stress in, in a healthier way. Um, all of these have been tried and tested in, and proven to uh, work. So that's the most important thing. Um, I also wanted to thank Jennifer Miller and everyone at Lions Companies for inviting us in today. Uh, with our, uh, our partnership with Lions Companies, we've created a custom portal experience uh, with Lions Companies. This custom portal experience will be available to each of you and up to five people within your organization to come into the portal for the next 90 days. Um, experience this presentation will be has been recorded and will be uploaded into the portal. We'll also be offering two other presentations over the course of the next uh, 90 days. And in addition to that, we'll you'll have uh, an insight uh, and, and a direct experience to work with uh, guided meditations, movement practices, breathing practices. You'll have access to our Studio B teachers uh, on this global platform. So we will be uh, getting all the information out to each of you through email over the next 24 hours, and you will each receive an individual invitation to uh, jump right into the Lions Company's platform experience on the Studio B network. Uh, I think that's all I have. Did I miss anything, Christine? <laughs> no, no, I just take advantage of the portal it's uh again it's like stepping into your uh, just such a beautiful array of offerings really to support you in that one really critical thing which is what do i need it starts there what do i need to support myself so that i can best lead your tasks are monumental right now you've got to take care of yourself Absolutely. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to either Christine or directly to me. You could find us both on studiobmindfulness.com and our emails are jennifer at studio at I'm sorry, at meetyourcenter.com. We just transitioned our domain name or christine at meetyourcenter.com. And you could find the website again at studiobmindfulness.com or at meetyourcenter dot com to find us and more information about our offerings. Thank you so much. Thank you. Christine and Have Jen, thank you both so much for your time and thank you uh, to the participants and uh, that'll uh, wrap up the seminar today.